Welcome on a very special day. We're super lucky with the weather. You're going to hear a lot of interesting, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to say background noise because it's definitely not noise, a background concert. There are so many birds around us. We're going to have some special guests probably. Um, and we're here with the bird watchers, so we're going to also hear which birds they are. Um, but that's not the reason we're here. We're here in a beautiful farm, um, one of the leading ones, I think, in the Netherlands. Uh, with the second episode, depending when you're watching this, in, in, if this ever turns into a series, of the Farmer's Philosophy series. And I'm very happy that Anna is hosting us today. Uh, in a, yeah, we couldn't have wished for a better background. So thank you so much for a better stage almost to, to ho have us here today and to uh, accept uh, our, our open invitation. Like, when can we come and uh, put two chairs in your field and chat a bit? Yeah, great that you're here, yeah. So just for people to have a bit of an understanding. Of course, you can watch this on video and audio. We'll, we'll release both. But if you're watching, if you're only listening to this, um, where are we? Just to give a bit of context. What's the context around us? And try to be visually for anybody that can see it, can definitely see it. But anybody that's listening, just to give a bit of an understanding and an idea of what we, we have around us. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, we're at Bodemzicht Farm. Uh, which Google still uh, translates as bottom view, but it's really meant to be soil perspective. Soil so, perspective, yeah, okay. So yeah. that first uh, out of the way. <laughs> We're right to the south of the city of Nijmegen in uh, Malde, in the east of the Netherlands. And we're in a beautiful estate, uh, the estate of Grootstal, 20 hectare estate. And we're a tenant here of uh, over five hectares. Um, we're now sitting in a very flowery May uh, no dig Market's garden with over 150 kinds of uh, herbs, vegetables, flowers, uh, seeds that we sell. And we are regenerating five hectares here next to the forest. Uh, now mostly um, epic grasslands, I would say, but we're growing it into an agroforestry system and we're also running our uh, our layers in uh, chicken mobiles, uh, yeah, with our holistic plants grazing throughout the parkour we set up on the on the land. In terms of time context, when did you land here? Four years ago. Only four years, okay. Only so. four years ago, yeah. And, and this is the fourth season. The fourth so you season. Could say three and a half years of farming on the ground. Yeah. Wow. And what has been the biggest surprise? That you're still here, maybe? No, they're like, what, what's the... <laughs> Thankfully we are, we made it. Yeah, no, yeah, the biggest surprise for me, and it's still, I find it amazing, is the speed of regeneration. I've never expected to see, especially the fields, uh, because it was in a pretty degraded uh, state, to see life return so fast, to see the soil rebounds, to see the grasses grow so tall. I remember when we were here, uh, when we started, and I was standing in the field and I was saying to people, the grass has got to be 1.5 meters long at least. But I didn't know that whether it would actually happen. I thought, yeah, it's going to work. But uh, yeah, we still needed to prove it. And yeah, now we have a field uh, with 1.5 meter tall grasses. Yeah, there's some great pictures. <laughs> there's some great pictures you took, like the first year, second, third, and you can see the speed. And I mean, in the market garden, somehow, of course, this is very intensive yeah. uh, in, in a different way than, than the neighbors are intensive, but this is very intensive. But I think the fields, yeah, as you mentioned, are almost a better example. Like, what are your, like what's been the management on the fields um, and, and why, why that surprise of the speed? Yeah. Like it's chickens impact and, and agroforestry where it grows too, but yeah. mostly the chicken impact, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, and then, then the rest. So because you reason from the perspective of the of the grass and the soil, of the grasses and the soil. So when we when we started and we had uh, well, if you looked at one uh, square meter, it would be fifty percent of bare soil was super compacted. It felt actually like concrete. Uh, there was no worm. It was very sad. We uh, we, we searched. Yeah, worms. we did a worm count without worm with a primary school class. Searched for a worm. We found one worm in the whole afternoon, and it was tiny. Uh, so that was bad news. And um, and it's also a, a challenging place for for Dutch context because it's a high sandy soil. Uh, the water level is ten meters deep, so that's uh, very dry for Dutch conditions. And, um, and the grass wouldn't grow taller than uh, my shins. So it was very, that was it. And there was still uh, a lot what of poison What was happening spray. there? Yeah, what was happening? Was it used for hay or what It was, was used for hay. So that was good for several years. So it hadn't been plowed for a few years. That's, that was good. Uh, but uh, still it was sort of mowed to the bone. Yeah, it was for cattle feed, uh, grassland. Uh, but yeah, 50% uh, bare soil grassland. 
uh, and there was it was still sprayed. Okay. Yeah. So that obviously stopped, and then what happened, or what what did you bring in the the ladies? Yeah. Well, first uh, we started with rest, mm -hmm. uh, then we brought in the ladies, but we also had some lease cows uh, that we had with another entrepreneur in this region who was managing cows. We thought, okay, we can have one cycle of cows. Um, uh, that will be amazing because that will also. No. Kickstart a lot. Yeah. Kickstart our soil a lot. So we worked with uh, one round of lease cows one year and then our chickens running the holistic plant uh, grazing plan uh, coming back only in 50 weeks. So it's a very long a cycle year, yeah. uh, because also we are not managing for grassland. We are managing for an open forest system. Yes. So we are making very long cycles to get as much carbon quickly into the soil as we can. And, uh, Do you yeah. see that changing now? Like, the, is it 50 weeks and now because of nature kicking back in, etc., that you can reduce that? Like, can you speed it up or is the carrying capacity, like, can you have more chickens? It or? depends. It always, because also management comes into practice. So, yeah, we see that we can speed it up, but we also have management, uh, for example, in the winter when we really can have these freezing temperatures, we would like to have them close so we just can take care of them if anything freezes. Or So it's not only the, uh, the soil that has to be taken into account or the, the rebouncing of the grasses, but also uh, people walking their dogs here. So in certain places you don't want to be there in winter uh, next to the forest. And if you take that all into account, it's slightly more complex. Yeah. And have there been other surprises on on the people side? Um, you said uh, my biggest surprise is the the speed of recovery, yeah. especially in the fields. And and on the people side, I mean, many people have passed through here. I think with courses and open days yeah. and and unannounced as well. Um, what have been surprises there? Well, I think the the most beautiful surprise is that I I didn't understand that as well when I started the farm. But what I think I'm seeing is that people are well, in three years, regenerative sort of exploded, like as a... Timing is everything. <laughs> yeah. Timing is everything. Timing is everything in entrepreneurship, yeah. investing, Exactly. Everywhere. So we were, we were just before uh, regenerative was something um, that was yeah, going around and people understood what was... Uh, or people had a curiosity about it because when we started, they, they sort of didn't. We were just too early. But now it's, it's completely changed. So uh, there are so many people so curious about regeneration and... I think, um, yeah, that's just amazing to see that so many, everybody wants to, well, a lot of people, not everyone yet, but a lot of people want to do something with it because it energizes them. And I think one of the biggest insights for me that I have is that I think that deep down we all feel nourished by landscapes like this, by food like, like this. Um, and so what I'm seeing is that a very broad range of people somehow feel attracted to this, to come and visit uh, our farm. So uh, that could be investors, for example, but also uh, uh, multinational people who work at the multinational, uh, primary schools, scientists, policy makers, artists. Like, so that's interesting. You see that this, this regenerative movement has the potential to reach so many different people and somehow, since Corona, uh, for me, it's also very, since COVID, it's also very logic because I think a lot of people also realize that a landscape like this, full of life, nourishes you. Like with COVID, everybody wanted to walk in the forest, not on a parking place uh, and not in an empty field for a good reason, because it doesn't nourish you and it doesn't energize you. So I think one of the biggest surprises that I had is I think, hey, perhaps innate in every human being, there is this love for life that is sort of stored deep down in there. And even if you're not aware that the birds are singing right now, you feel more re-energized if you're in a surrounding where there is a lot of bird sounds around. So, yeah. And then they, they walk through the gate. I mean, there's not really, oh, there's, there's a gate actually. <laughs> and, and then what is normally the reaction of people? Do you see their shoulders going down and like, or, or do people, depending on the group maybe as well, like multinational or, or scientist or, or skeptic in general maybe, yeah. like how do people walk through the gate and then you, you, you have a coffee together and you, you do a tour, of course, if they organize themselves and don't show up uh, unannounced, which is annoying when you have to farm. Um, but like what's the, their normal journey here? Like do you see, is there a pattern you see? Because you've had so many people on, on the farm yeah. here on this, this landscape. 
is there a pattern you see? Like, yeah. okay, I know if I bring them there normally first there and then there, then something releases or something relaxes? Yeah, immediately. As soon as people, we're so close to the city. So people drive up here immediately when they we drive yeah, out of the city or on their bikes. You can literally see almost the bikes. McDonald's from the drive. Yeah, we can that's, see the That's, that's, that's how close drive. we are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. People relax. So they relax uh, in this surrounding and I, I see it happen, but also, and I think it's more interesting, even they open up. So um, I think also this space and this lively space also helps people to open up and to talk about other things. So to talk more about values, for example, or what really motivates them, or what really drives them. And a lot of people that come to visit are also, I think, searching for something. And perhaps they don't have the clarity to really formulate what they are searching for, uh, but somehow they come here to find an answer uh, to, their, to their search. Yeah. They didn't write their holistic context yet, but they might in the future. <laughs> no, it's but it's fascinating. I mean, that's why one of the reasons I want to do these interviews where yeah. we don't really have a script, but I'm super curious with sitting down literally on, on location in person, because most of the interviews we do are, are thanks to technology and we can, we can interview anywhere. Um, but to be able to sit down and ask other questions than how do we build up soil health as quickly as possible, um, is, a, is a luxury. And sometimes it works also online. I remember one of the interviews we did with Matt Chatfield and I'm, I'm too lazy to be, to be farming against nature, something like that. And that <laughs> somehow we clicked also online. And, and I still want to sit down with him uh, in, in his uh, managed forest with, with the sheep and just uh, uh, talk in general. But that will happen at some point. Matt, you might be listening. Um, but I think the, be able to, the fact that you can sit between stuff that's alive instead of in front of a screen makes a, makes a big difference. Yeah. And... Then do you get like sort of follow-up emails then of people or phone calls of people that once they leave, then they change things or like do they ever do, does this this impact feedback between brackets reach you like the, are there yeah. inspiring stories like people like after this it really something clicked or something triggered yeah, and I we made did. exchange yeah, yeah a lot actually yeah and it, it's also something we didn't foresee. Uh, we we've, we've thought, well, we're going to start a farm. Yes, of course. And we're going to sh share. It's also a space. It's a learning place. So we want to help other farmers to start. We want people to, to see that they can eat in a different way. We also want this a, a, a place where, you know, what John D. Leo would call the tsunami of consciousness, where we somehow can help that uh, tsunami, uh, yeah. to, to make that tsunami happen. But um yeah we didn't really foresee that it would be a place where people would really come to search for uh yeah personal uh somehow to answer to personal yeah. questions or meaning or and that is really happening so that was something we we didn't really foresee and now that it's happening it's, it's beautiful but it also feels like a huge responsibility <laughs> yeah we have it too sometimes people reach out and say like oh, i'm in the space because of you or yeah. and the work you do and i'm like oh i hope you like it because otherwise yeah like, <laughs> you know it's, it's really beautiful but it's fascinating and, with and, a market yeah. garden and and holistic plant grazing with chickens that you have that impact Nothing against it, but compared to, I don't know, maybe we should think, okay, you have this experience in, a, in an old grown forest. We don't have them anymore in the Netherlands, yeah. but like a really ancient place. And no, it's a place full of life. And that is enough to, to trigger things, which is yeah. fascinating yeah. to see like how far we are away from that problem. We recognize, oh, this is alive. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. It feels different. Something's happening here. Yeah. And it's also because we always, I mean, we always had the plan to make it also uh, like uh, what in Dutch you would call a flying wheel. So a place where things, people meet and things kickstart or where we can help people along. So we did have that uh, plan always, but we didn't expect that to go this fast. And also we literally had people here that came for a tour and that's, and that emailed me, yes, I just, you know, you gave me the kick that I needed. Now I'm farming uh, and that's amazing. Uh, but we also had people doing the long course who had a divorce because they wrote their holistic context and that's huge. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I mean, people, gratefully thank you <laughs> afterwards for it so but it's you, okay you have a moment like but, okay yeah like, like okay yeah. Oh, yeah wow okay so so things happen because people get clarity uh, especially when they write a realistic context and so uh, let's let's talk through that what for people that don't know what is a holistic context 
yeah, it's something that actually we would love to have started with if we knew <laughs> that it would make perfect sense. So that's why we now are teaching it in that way. Like you first write your holistic context and then uh, you start working on your business plan because then you have clarity. So the holistic context is basically a framework that helps you to make the right decisions for your context. And uh, you not answer only, several questions. Not only the farming context, the participation, context. the, the yep. deepness of the yep. groundwater and all of that. Yeah. But so this comes from before. Alan yeah. Savory, yeah. Uh, but we are also, uh, thankfully to Eaton Solofiev, we're also sort of mixing it up and making it into a version that is, we think, a little bit more accessible. Uh, so That's one of the issues <laughs> with, with Alan, yeah. He's yeah. great, but yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, so yeah, accessibility so is uh, an issue. okay. It's an important issue. So, so you we, say even before yeah. the whole entrepreneurship piece, the business piece, the business plan, and all of exactly. that. What is your holistic context? Yeah, and then we let people just inventorize what what Ethan Solovyev would call the eight forms of capital. I don't really like the word capital. I think it's more values we're talking about, but. That's the uh, we, we can we can tell it. Yeah, yeah. Should, you know, for sure he's so, not he's not happy about the word yeah. either. But yeah. yeah, it fits in in the current financial context. Yes, it makes well. sense it as a people. translation term for sure. So yeah. we let people write down where are you financially, socially, experientially, like, and then they, it's sort of an inventorization of your life basically. And then we let them. And then you're surprised that big things happen after that. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah things are happening. No, there I'm not too surprised, but for the tours, yes. So, and then we get like, um, they answer basically three questions. Uh, in what kind of world do you want to live? What kind of life do you want to lead? And what are you committed to do to get there? So if you have these sort of uh, on paper, then you can basically start to write uh, right under your quality of life statements, uh, the life you want to lead, your your ultimate to-do list. And then, yeah, it things get pretty, pretty clear. Good, yeah. And, and yeah. many people that thought a farm, a regenerative focused farm was fitting there might find out that it's not because it might not fit. Yeah, yeah exactly. And if people Which go is good, out... Because that saves everybody a lot of time and resources and, and yeah. blood, sweat and tears and maybe other divorces. Yeah, and there are also other uh, spaces in the regenerative field where you can work. I mean, uh, regenerative farming is never going to spread widely unless we also don't have regenerative economics and politics and a different educational system. So it makes total sense uh, that we're not all farming. I think. <laughs> Which maybe is like an interesting answer to people that walk through the door here or through the gate and are, are curious, like you said, and interested and all sort of have in their mind, okay, the answer, the only answer is me starting a farm. And, and then actually the context might be maybe not, or maybe yeah. Um, yeah, we have so many other jobs to fill and we need so many more people focusing on the food system. I think that's a general, and, and there is... There are a lot of jobs to, to do. We need a lot more farmers, a lot of more hands in and around the soil, but also we need new machinery, we need new technology, we need brands, we need delivery, we need distribution, we need... We need all those skills and knowledge and passions to, to make it happen, basically. It's, it's, it's a paradigm change. And then how do you, I'm not saying bring that message, but of course people figure that out by themselves, but like what, what would you say to people that do the long course with you and go through that holistic context with themselves. Like, what's the percentage that comes out and says, "Yeah, a farm is the answer for me and us"? Mostly, I think. Yeah. Imagine it, it must fit whatever your context socially is as well. Like, what what is your guess? Is it ten percent, fifty, eighty? I think uh, twenty, thirty percent. Yeah, and then the that say, okay, I think farming is for me, and the, those who are actually going to start a farm might be even less, uh, yes. because it needs so much commitment still i mean if you want to start a, a successful regenerative farm despite current economics and rules and regulations and everything that is not made necessarily for this type of farming yeah you need uh you need commitment and perseverance and and that's something that uh an entrepreneurial drive yeah and that's that's not necessarily easy to uh, it's not an easy task yet. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing ever to do, but it needs serious, serious commitment. And I think a lot of people still find that quite scary to, to commit that much. Yeah. And do you see roles also here, but also in general, I think you hear a lot, okay, how do we stack businesses or how do you somehow 
organize it in a way that it's not all on one person or you in this case the general you or like we need the regenerative farmer to be amazing at everything apart from the, the spreadsheets yeah. fundraising growing selling marketing washing distribution like that that's a tall order packing <laughs> eggs yeah. and 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 making machines and fixing every like do you see because here there's 20 hectares in total you're doing five like of course the first few years you're doing everything but do you see ways to start um, specialization there and also like okay there there is a role for people that don't want to do everything from from the start or yeah. maybe at the start yes but not everything indefinitely for 60 70 hours a week and 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 that's going to lead to a lot of burnouts and yeah, divorces yeah. yeah now the first thing to do is to get the team on the ground uh, so you actually don't have to do it all yourself i mean that's uh, we've also been building up a team uh, so we can manage that better. And uh, the second step is, I think, in your bioregion uh, to collaborate as well as you can with other entrepreneurs, with other amazing people that are doing uh, things, and to also point out niches. Uh, like, for example, hey, we can use a great uh, composting uh, enterprise in our region, or hey, um, especially processing. I see a lot of potential there uh, to Which collaborate. Which is a job. Like, that's better if... Yeah. That's the thing you do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's something I would do you rather think that the not animal, do. <laughs> do you think yeah, the yeah. animal side of processing or other, like when you say processing, what's your biggest uh, need uh, there? Chestnuts, for example. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of chestnuts in 10 years, uh, hopefully with other farmers and food forests around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, chestnuts is, are amazing. I mean, we could start make chestnut flour, eat chestnut bread, chestnut pizza. But it's nice if somebody else does it. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Open yes. invitation. The next yeah. years, it's a growing business, like it's a... It's, it's a, a, a gradual organic growth, but they're going to be a lot. And when they come, yeah, it's a lot. Exactly. So it's also a, a scale issue always. Like when, at what moment is it, uh, does it make sense to combine, you know, strength because we have a scalability issue. And then, of course, you need other entrepreneurs who can help you with it. Yeah. And we discussed it a bit off camera before, like the, is it more important, like the entrepreneur piece or the entrepreneurial skill? Do you see, I, what we see in the podcast and what gives me almost most hope is people with entrepreneurial experience and skill from other sectors getting very excited and hooked on soil and, and reaching out, like what do we need to build? Like how can people with experience of raising money, building teams, um, getting, getting shit done basically from zero to one, like when nobody sees something and then there's a compost company or something like that. And, and do you get them here as well? Like, is that something that also happens in the context of Nijmegen and Bodemzicht? Or is it more like on the global context that we, we observe? Do you, do you get the, the bouncing entrepreneurs here as well that want to start something in this space? Not necessarily maybe on the farming side, but on something else. And, and is that... Does that click with you? Like, is that yeah. fun and interesting? Yeah, we get them certainly. Yeah, and uh, yes, that is very interesting because I do think we need... Uh, certainly for these first reference points everywhere, we need uh, these entrepreneurial people that can become a reference for others uh, to start or to work at as a company. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, so we definitely get them. I do get sometimes the, 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 the thing that I, sometimes is a bit of a, a difference uh, with the way we form, like the holistic working and thinking, that's sometimes still very difficult. Uh, for some of these entrepreneurs that perhaps if they come here with the mindset, okay, we need another app, uh, tech startup, or we need this, or we need this, that doesn't uh, really necessarily facilitate life. So that's... So what do you um, tell them then? Like, where do you, like, how do you try to trigger that process with them? Like, well, I asked them, I say like, like um, I don't believe at all, and I think it's very important to say, I don't think there's an opposition between uh, tech-focused farmers or life... Like, I think where we need to go, if you ask me what kind of world do you want to live in, I want to live in a world of abundance, full of life, because that feeds me, that nourishes me, but also I think that is the only security for us as human beings uh, to simply exist and thrive also in the future. So I welcome all technology that facilitates that. But I do think that uh, nine out of 10 still, uh, things are being developed or startups are being made that not necessarily really facilitate life. And that's where the, the challenge lies. Like, okay, how can we actually come up with something that, that does exactly that? Yeah. And probably 
in order to come up with that, you need to go through some kind of personal journey yes. and spend maybe a season here or a season on a farm, really working, really understanding. And, and then you will come up with things like, oh, that could be yes. way faster, better, efficient, whatever. Yeah, um, you need to be had, in but touch. But you need to be really, yeah. you cannot come up with this from an office somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And, that's, and I think that's, to, and that's also, it's the same story is for policy. Uh, same story for economics. You can also not make a, a policy that really facilitates regenerative agriculture from an office. I do think one of the most um, important things is to get back in touch. I don't know if they necessarily need to be at the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, when you know the, the, the student or the, Maybe the apprentice farmer. Maybe a tour farmer. is but good enough yeah, or enough to... To be a loop, mm -hmm. like to be one of the loops perhaps that that is necessary to... because. Honestly, if you, it's, it's just what Charles Eisenstein is saying, right? It's like we have this culture of separation. We lost connection. Exactly. And we need to get back in touch, you know, like mm -hmm. seriously, culturally back in touch. And I think Why that's... Why are we wearing shoes? No, like... Yeah. Yeah. And it's so fundamental that I think that the, the, the question of this century might be like, how do we actually become native again? How do we have this reciprocity again? How do we feel this reciprocity, embodied experience of it with the rest of life? And, and that's something that's a real process. And I think it's going to take Dutch people generations. <laughs> yeah. But do you, you say you don't necessarily have to be on the farm, but you need to be enough connected and enough, there's an element of time there. It's not that I can walk on, a, I do a small tour. Maybe some people after that change their life, but because that farm piece was part of a much longer journey. You were just like the, the little, the last straw that, what is it, killed the horse back, something? Um, don't email me. And <laughs> camels. The camel's back, that's the one. And, but, so, of course there's no answer to that, but like there's no answer, like it's a specific answer to everybody. Like how much, like a small tour feels like not enough to, to reconnect yeah, with that, but it's yeah. part of that journey. And then people yeah. go home or to the office, and that's a big yeah, uh, that's piece. And, and we were talking about policy before, like you had policy makers, which are not necessarily politicians, but policy makers here as well. What in that group, I don't know how many you had, if you can say any generalized things about it, but what's their response here? Like when they walk in here, of course, they, they might yeah. be part of a tour, they're sort of forced because their department is going or something like yeah. that. W what happens when, when the people that design all the rules that basically make most of this really difficult for you uh, walk through, through the gate? Yeah, yeah. I, do, I, they I, net, do they notice that disconnect yeah. with nature, that they're fundamentally disconnected or is it really suits yeah. and ties? No, and they, they, I mean, they understand when they, when they are here because I can give them very specific examples uh, for, hey, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me uh, um, to, <laughs> to have five organizations uh, to put my egg in a box, you know, like uh, to deal with five organizations. It complicates things a lot. Or Well, eggs is a very interesting, on paper at least, yeah. business to start with because there's demand and stuff and things. But if you have to deal with five organizations yeah, and a lot of roles. Yeah, if you have to deal with five organizations and bird flu regulations, it's not an interesting business line. So the I can explain them very uh, easily, like on the ground examples. This is what I have to do. Well, this makes it very complicated. Uh, but also, for example, we now have a new um, subsidy uh, system that is there to, uh, yeah, to encourage a more green measures in farming and landscape elements. You have to put your landscape elements in the RVO uh, website overview uh, thing. And I've went through the whole procedure and in the end it turns out that um, I'm not spraying anything organic on my plants. No, I'm not spraying at all and that's not even a box. So, there are so there's no other? No, no. So there's a lot of examples that if you go quite radically Ecological. You don't fit in the box. <laughs> There's yeah. no box for you. But you can actually not take it, which means you cannot finish the procedure, which means you're not going to exactly. get any money. I can money. get a subsidy for a pig-friendly floor, but I cannot get a subsidy for pigs outside. Pigs outside. So there, all the time you have the, the boxes that are missing, so you cannot tick a box. And of course, people when they're here, they, if you give those examples, they realize that that doesn't necessarily facilitate this kind of farming. So... Um, 
yeah, the, the, I can have this conversation on the on the ground. But what I do notice, and that's not only with policy makers, by the way, but I notice that with a lot of people that come here, that's an interesting thing. I think it's also a little bit part of our cultural problem. And I'm speaking about the Dutch context here because I think it's a Western civilization issue, uh, very clearly. Is that like because you are doing something different? people ask you to take on even more responsibility. So I get a lot of people who come here and say, hey, amazing what you're doing. Can you also not contact this person or do this work? Or uh, instead of asking, what can I do? And somehow something went wrong with responsibility or celebrating responsibility in our culture. I mean, I think we also see it in the political field. If politicians really take on responsibility, they're not necessarily um, celebrated. celebrated for that or not necessarily people go out and vote for this person because they take up this responsibility and I, I think it's an issue because it's there's a risk that we keep being in this mindset like yeah we recognize the problem but what are you gonna do instead of hey we recognize the problem what can I do I within my company uh, within the government uh, like what can I Start it, to do. And it's that's, easy, like yeah. the system is like that, they should blah 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 and, and yeah, it, it doesn't um, translate into action, exactly. which is what we absolutely yeah. need. And, and I think you mentioned an example somewhere of thinking like an entrepreneur instead of acting and doing like an entrepreneur, which is a course somewhere. Um, but that is the big difference, like the entrepreneur yeah. does, for good and bad, because we've seen many examples where yeah. it goes horribly wrong, but at least there's action. Yeah. which means there's movement, which means there's impact, which means there could be net positive impact, could be a horribly negative impact, but at yeah. least there is something and, and not um, inaction or no movement, which is not what nature likes to do. Yeah, like, there's I, always movement. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's exactly the change we need to make. And, then, and that's also a person, that's the personal journey. Because I, even if you know, I mean, rationally, if you know all the steep climate graphs, the horrible that loss horrible of life. That horrible slide that Bart von Fresh always shows. Social like, yeah. inequality, like all entangled and uh, growing out of control, spiraling out of control. Like then you might know it rationally, but it doesn't mean you feel it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the big difference comes in. Comes in. We need to let this, this rational knowledge sink in. And then when you feel it, I think there you're gonna act pretty quickly because um, because the urgency personally grows. And that's where the in touch, I think, is so important because when you start to get back in touch, you start also to get back in touch with your body and with that feeling of urgency that is not only a rational fact. And, and, and that will change everything. And you can get back in touch by being at a farm. And I mean, if you make policy on farms, please go to farms. I mean, that makes total sense. And not just for a tour, like spend some yes, proper time. Exactly. Do some Talk stuff. Talk to farmers and, and get your you know, like first uh, yes. level information. But also you can also get back in touch in cities because it's, there's no nature culture divide. That's only there in our heads. But yes, there are also oyster catchers on roofs in offices and you can actually engage with this, interact with these other beings also in the cities also in your office. So I think that's what we need to cultivate. So I'm taking a leap here, but to, for us to get back in touch with ourselves, with being part of nature, with um, other beings and, and all of that surround us, is it then better to, or have you seen, maybe you actually answered the question already at the beginning, to be in a place full of life, like here, or to really feel the damage, the suffering to be in a place that is extremely degraded. Like go to places where the desert is in, encroaching or go to, like what, what do you, because you see the effect here in a place that's absolutely full of life and, and maybe some other people go to Greenland and see the, the melting ice caps or, or glaciers and, and like, in your experience, what's like, is it maybe more powerful to be in life or? I think what the powerful thing is, is to get out of this role of being the beholder. It doesn't matter whether you're beholding like uh, a degraded landscape or a landscape full of life. I think the key is to interact yourself. That's what's, I think, crucial to get back in touch. And you can interact wherever, mm -hmm. uh, preferably in a place that you call home, where you feel at home. 
uh, but to start interacting, even if it's just very small thing, like just putting a birdhouse or uh, changing something in your garden or... Uh, but the thing is, I think because of this, I also see that with a lot of people visiting, by the way, this nature culture divide works in two ways. Like right, we are sort of afraid to interact. There's like a threshold almost. Like um, uh, 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 Ricardo, my partner, he loves to go into the forest wearing uh, scissors. So he can just uh, prune while he's making a walk in the forest and enabling the trees that he sees there. You know, oh, I prune this one a little bit, that one can come up. Uh, to be the gardeners that we actually are um, and, and to, yeah, to start acting. And we find it very scary because we, we have this image of ourselves as damaging human beings, which is, of course, the sustainability paradigm. Like, okay, how do I be a less damaging human being? That's a worldview. That's a self-image that in itself is very damaging. Because if we start to understand that we can actually facilitate life, that we can make a positive social, economic, ecological impact as human beings, we also start to understand that we can do that because of interaction. And, then and intervention start and management exactly. and doing things, and action. It's, yeah, yeah. it's not a problem if you make mistakes. Like that's where you learn from. Like it, it's actually inherently part of the interaction is that you will fail in so many ways. And that's great. But you get feedback from all these other beings. And that's fantastic. If you hang a, up this little birdhouse and no bird is going to live in there. Okay, apparently you did something wrong yeah let's put it somewhere else or uh let's change it around hey what's happening now so it's also it's all about listening like how do we listen again to grasses to birds to to frogs and how uh how do we get cultivated sensitivity again to listen to this feedback that we get all the time by the way the climate crisis is i think one of the biggest feedback loops we're getting at the moment but yeah, that, that but you see a general response of people, and I'm imagining also people that walking through on, onto to this farm is yeah, let's be less damaging human beings, almost yeah. a bit shy, and I'm, I'm imagining yeah. like a, a physical appearance of how can I minimize yeah. my role, or, or should we be here as as human beings, and should we even like like should we just go to Mars or or go extinct, and that would be better? And, and it's very sad. And it's very sad. So sad, yeah. And, and also very damaging yeah. because we've seen from many examples, like if you remove, like somehow we are, what is the term, super keystone species. We are exactly. the gardeners, we are yeah. interaction. We've been doing that in a different way. And, and so we better learn to change that. But it, it's a very, yeah, sort of wishing yourself away message is very sad yeah. and very uh, not empowering. It's and not a perspective basically. No, it's basically, yeah. let's yeah. hope that we don't touch anything and don't move, don't breathe preferably, and then, then it's, get, it's going to get, be solved. And, and we see, especially the places that are thriving, there's a lot of human interaction and there's a lot of other living beings interaction managed and interacted by with humans. And that's a disconnect. Yeah, we're like you, we walk through the forest, but we don't dare to touch or move anything. And we, because we don't really know. We, we think we're going to damage it and, and something it's, is going to go wrong. Sides, eh? like from the, you could say from the hardcore agricultural side, it's like, yeah, nature and culture are so, you can never, you know, this image exists like you can never farm because that's so-called so culture with so-called nature because these are two it's the word agriculture yeah, yeah exactly entirely different things uh, also in your zoning plans you're either nature or your agriculture that's already very telling and then but it's also from the hardcore nature side which i find very fascinating is that Great. it's super separated if we are we are having um more and more protected species arriving at our farm, which is amazing, which is why we farm. The mission of our farm is to facilitate life. So fantastic that they arrive. But the, I also have a problem if these species arrive. That's the paradox, because we think that, yeah, it's nature, so that should be human exclusive, gate around it, you know? It's like and, um, and 30 the, meter around the Betcher Burrow or whatever. And the fact and, that you're doing the fact that you're farming created the circumstances and facilitated life to come here. Exactly. But then the rules make sure that you cannot farm anymore to facilitate life that then would That's move not away. That's an option. Like, yeah. like it's not an no, option it's in, just... in, and, and it's, it's not an option for like the hardcore uh, nature people, but also for hardcore agricultural policy. Like it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. And when people hear this and say, ah, <laughs> oh, that sounds hopelessly naive. I don't think that, but what is your, because you must get that question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. 
it's naive. I'm not, not even going to say how you're going to feed the world because that's not a relevant question on this podcast. No. <laughs> and and <laughs> I think it's been pretty proven many. Pretty colonial question also. Pretty colonial question. Yeah, yeah. Newsflash, we're not feeding the world or we're feeding the world many Let's times over. Let's start feeding our community. Let's start feeding us yeah. in general. Um, at the event we were, there was an amazing answer of somebody of the food forest movement saying, yeah, my neighbors are feeding cows. Like they're, they're harvesting corn and no soy, but some other stuff. And, and like we at least are feeding people. So let's yeah. start with that. Yeah. So we're not going there. But if yeah. people like get this look, not even saying it, but maybe get this look, that's really naive. What is your, do you have a go-to answer? Do you have a, um, an, a question or an invitation to them? If people like really come with this, this is all nice and funny and cute and small, but uh, it's never going to work. Well, the first invitation would be come and have a look how much food we produce. Insanity, like, uh, yeah, like even even quantity. We're not even talking, of course, about the quality of the food and the nutrient density of the food, which would also mean logically that if you have more nutritious food because your soil life is thriving, you also need less quantity. Uh, but you can grow an amazing amount of uh, food here on 1500 square meters. We're growing food for 100 households and seven restaurants, and we still have an abundance of food. So also for other beings to eat along, yeah? because I think it's super important to realize we're not only growing food for human beings, like our community consists of humans, plants, animals, and microbes. It's all part of what And they do eat, they come by they and they know, they know their lunches. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's also, that's where the, you know, tension, I'm, yeah. well, tension, no, it's, it's like a relationship. Uh, it has all the colors. So sometimes it's love, sometimes it's friendship, sometimes it's okay, we exist uh, alongside each other, but, and sometimes you need your own space, like all these colors are there. So I, I think as a regenerative farmer, you're above all a relationship manager. And what we're working towards is towards this- the director of the orchestra. Yeah, thriving ecosystem where everybody eats each other, but nonetheless, there is enough food for everyone because everybody eats each other. And that's the, the beauty of it. And what I would say to people who, who doubt that, I would say, how can you ever doubt millions of years of fine-tuned co-evolution uh, as something that's not working. I mean, that's such a human-centric perspective to think that we, we would just arrive, by the way, if you look at the, uh, <laughs> the scale of, yeah. How can we think that we can do anything more sophisticated than, for example, the beautiful process of photosynthesis that is so amazingly complex and fine-tuned. We still haven't figured out exactly how it works. <laughs> no, this interaction in the soil, we were only discovering how amazingly complex it is, but also what's going on in terms of communication, uh, nutrient transportation, um, healthcare, uh, like all these things, we're only touching up on it. And uh, what I find fascinating and also a bit worrisome is that from our cultural perspective, we keep being amazed by these things. Instead of saying like, how, how on earth could it be that uh, trees are communicating underground and you get, you know, these sort of newspaper headlines like, oh, tree amazing stalk. tree stalk. It's like, yeah, the amazing thing is that after all these years, we are still surprised by this. That is amazing. And that we knew it and, and like coming back to your point of being more native, like we forgot it very recently. Like it's not that like we didn't know, and many people still know indigenous, like it's a very Western thing. Like, oh, trees are trees. No, trees are part of a big system. They, you cannot even argue if there's an individual tree, probably not. And, and probably it's, it's connected to, to everything else. And it does feel, it does talk uh, in a very different language, but for sure we'll figure out at some point how we can listen. Um, and, and then you have to somehow marry that with a spreadsheet and yeah. paying FTEs <laughs> and like yeah. how, do, how does that make sense in your head? Like how do you not get super annoyed by the current economic contest where you don't get paid for quality unfortunately? I mean with some chefs of course you do and, and starting to hopefully work with, with the hospital behind here um, but do you get frustrated about that? Like the current e economic yeah. context you're in and the policy context and like it seems basically geared to make sure this doesn't happen. And I see that with many innovators, and we see that as well, like it's also part of their role is to change that, mm -hmm. but it's super frustrating. Like how, do you get very frustrated and what do you do about it, if so? <laughs> Yes. Well, my question. The, the, Asking for a yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no, the good thing was when we started this, we knew we were gonna hit our head uh, against several. Yeah, you can know it, but then doing uh, it is, is yeah, different. Yeah, it's, it's a different thing. So the um, 
Yeah, the thing is the translation towards Excel sheets, uh, towards cash flow statements, towards no, things that you really need also to, to make your company work as a company. Um, that, yeah, that's not so much a problem. I mean, it takes some energy to translate everything and you compartmentalize the complexity for sure. It's literally a box eh, in Excel. But it's literally I don't think it's such a problem to do that, to make complex things complicated as long as you are really aware that you're doing it mm -hmm. and that you're making that segregation for a reason and it doesn't come go at the cost of the complexity in the field uh, i think it's actually quite could be a useful tool and we're very good at it as human beings so i think we should also use that quality uh, we have there um, but the thing that i find frustrating about the economic situation is that if you don't exploit your workers, your human workers, yeah? but also your more than human workers all around, uh, your soil, uh, um, yeah, the, the community, uh, the climate, if you don't exploit that, you will always be more expensive than a, a farmer who doesn't necessarily take that into account. And what I find very frustrating is that I think poison-free um, artificial pesticide free, but especially nutritious, healthy, locally grown, nurturing landscape food should be a basic human right for everyone. Everybody should have access to this kind of food. At least enough to sustain yourself. Yeah, we, th I mean, that should be the basic of what we share with our communities. And what I find frustrating is that I am unable to share that because of economic barriers. Because I don't want to pay anybody less than minimum wage. And the, the, the issue is um, that I cannot solve that. that what, that's what I find one of the most frustrating things. Unless we get a true cost economy, I cannot bridge that gap. Uh, so, I, yeah, that's, that's where the frustration comes in. Like, yeah, I want to do more, but I cannot do it because of other barriers. Yeah, you're surfing the happy few or people that made, that have the money to pay for it, the chefs and thus the restaurants yeah. that, that pay attention to that, which is a very small minority, unfortunately. Yeah, for sure, the people in Nijmegen and that would love this, but... Yeah. That's Can't. very problematic. So what we do, well, we do use then solidary payments to ensure that at least some people can pay then what we call minimum, uh, if other people pay good. Mm -hmm. And that actually works on a community level, but it's not good enough for spreading this, you know, agriculture movement, making it more widespread. Yeah. And, and do you think then, do we need the other stuff to get more expensive or this to get cheaper, like on, or both sides, but what do you, somehow, I'm not saying subsidized, but paying you for ecosystem services, which is super yeah. hot, of course, in this space, or say, hey, let's take away the subsidies on the other side and let's start making sure they pay for the, uh, the externalities or, or the, 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 let's say, the waste in, in all its shapes and forms they create. Like, what do you see? What is a more facilitating life answer to this question? A difficult one. I, I think to include the cost would be the quickest way now to, to go. Just so to in really include the societal cost for uh, climate crisis, water pollution, uh, socially, uh, loss of life, soil degradation. If you're going to include that in the potato price, yeah, then we have a very expensive potato. But then we still didn't solve the issue of people having access to proper food. So because then the other food they're currently buying actually gets out gets of more reach. expensive. Yeah. So that's not only the solution. So then we also need to do a tax shift somehow uh, to uh, to make sure uh, that people can access this kind of food. And that's yeah, that's another question, like what would be most effective? I think also if you look in the Dutch situation, we started to pay so much, for example, for rent or housing or, you know, in other Energy, fields. Yeah, yeah, it needs to level out in other fields to make it accessible for everyone. Yeah. And, and do you think with the hospital next door that an angle could be I mean, I saw what your food ate laying on the, on, on the table yeah. there, but an angle could be especially the nutrient density, the health side of things, the flavor with yeah. people that are, um, that need it most, yeah. that are definitely mostly in the hospital because of food yeah. and, and because of the food they eat. Is yeah. that an angle? Because that's where we pay the costs. Yeah. We pay the cost as society, as healthcare system and as uh, insurance and, and all of us pick yeah. up that bill. Do you think that's an angle? To I think it's it's a very important angle to reach a, a broad group of people because I would love everybody to do this because they care about life. Yeah. I would love everybody to do this because they 
they really feel how much they care uh, about also other beings. Uh, but I'm afraid <laughs> that most people, that might take a while, I'm afraid that most people are uh, more motivated by the argument that concerns their own health. Uh, and that's uh, that's it's also a good thing. Let's use that to to spread uh, proper awareness um, and that's actually okay. also as an entrance entry point to understand that you are yourself an ecological being, and that you relate directly to soil. For example, your health relates directly to soil health. Well, that could be a beautiful entry point, not to only eat proper food, uh, but to also start to understand how you are entangled with all these other beings. Are you part of any early conversations, discussions there, like with the insurance that everybody always goes, ah, oh, then the insurance company should pay. I think it's very difficult for whatever policy re re reasons in Europe, but being so close to a major hospital here in, in the Netherlands um, and a university one, which usually means they're a bit more potentially edgy, let's say, um, like, are, are there any conversations happening around that with, with diabetes, with, with specifically like easily identifiable food related like uh, illnesses is that part of of your work now or or the conversations that that are happening or that's simply too early come back in yeah. a few years well we, we we try to start that conversation in several ways also um with um uh, uh plans for a planetary health garden right next to the uh, intensive care uh in corona times that was also a very important uh, perspective we were offering, but it's still pretty difficult because you also see that the hospital uh, is pretty compartmentalized in all these uh, different sectors. But we have some amazing people from uh, the green office of the Radboud, uh, but also an intensivist from uh, Radboud Medical Center that is also part of our uh, soil health quality uh, residency. So we have a residency program for several years with artists, with policymakers, with scientists that are um, well, measuring the quality of life in the soil. And uh, so we have some four front runners in that movement of planetary health that are connected to the farm. Also people doing research after uh, microbial activity above and in the soil and how that relates to microbial activity in your own gut. Uh, but yeah, it's just real starting <laughs> phase. It doesn't necessarily immediately translate in uh, a budget from the hospital and, uh, and a plan and, um, and that's role. But I do see it's popping up now. Now mostly because people stand up and say, hey, I want to give a planetary health course at university. Uh, but yeah, that also needs, of course, a little bit to be more embedded within the, within the current thinking uh, and not just uh, a few people giving a course. But I think I see a parallel there in agriculture. There's also a few people doing it differently. Yeah, but it also needs to be more than that. And, and it starts with people doing it, then connecting to each other. Hey, you're also working on planetary health. And that's happening right now. But then the next step, of course, is going to be, okay, how do we actually get some real tsunami here? <laughs> Instead of little waves. Yeah, yeah. So that's that still needs a lot of work. Yeah. And after these years, what's your biggest regret, if you have any? You can only describe as a, a success in all measurement, but for sure many thing, many lessons learned, let's yeah, say. Yeah, no. And we're going to ask about lessons learned. Make. Mistakes made, <laughs> yeah. which are all, all relevant. All part of the, part of the journey. That's how you can yeah. help train the next generation of farmers in, in the Netherlands as well. Um, but your, your regret, if you have one, or it's... Um, oh, that's a really good question. My biggest regret... It could also be not starting sooner. I mean, there's there's many, like it doesn't have to be a negative regret. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, yeah, it's negative, yeah, but it yeah. doesn't have, or not have done more yeah, because yeah. now we see. Yeah, no, I think that uh, one of the mistakes we made, and I think that's also something we're still working on, is like, how do you keep enough time continuously to regenerate yourselves? It's super important and we're very aware of that, but it's always... How many burnouts we have in the space. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that's, yeah. that's it. That's like really what you don't want. And the, the thing is that there is a risk and that's of course because we feel that urgency so strongly, there's a risk that everything is important. Because yes, it's important if a supermarket wants essential. to come by. And yes, it's important if a primary school wants or to come by Or a podcast maker well. that wants to film. Or a podcast maker that wants to film. It's all important. But the thing is, the most important thing of course is your own 
health and your own quality of life. So we have been well, also that's, seeing that's it's like... It's interesting when you say that. You're, does, do you feel a bit almost arrogant when you say that my own quality of life is the most important? Or as you're so connected, you know that without that... Yeah, but then this is, this is not working. So, and that's the interrelatedness. Like, that cannot be one or the other. It has to be both. So the, the thing is that, yes, because we feel, feel such an urgency, we have so many people coming in and that, that's amazing. But we also realized last year, okay, it has to be, uh, we have to go back to our own holistic context. Yeah, have like criteria, you, like yeah. does it fit or not? Yeah, and yeah. saying no is Exactly, and an saying art. no is super important, but it's hard because, uh, yeah, because of so many things need to happen and because you're so aware of that, uh, yeah. Um, we don't have the luxury to linger for years, you know? So, so that's, the, that's always, um, I think if you would talk of a regret, it's not really a regret, I would say, but it's just a continuous learning process. Like, yeah, okay, well, like now, for example, we have a free day on Monday. That's amazing. <laughs> not because this week was in general Pentecost, but yeah, in general, a free day on Monday. Yeah, yeah. a free day on Monday. And that's very important. And also on Tuesday, well, you are here now, which is also sorry. great. Yeah. But <laughs> no, don't be sorry for it. But usually this is the day where Ricardo and I um, are together at the farm and just, you know, ling working Linger. around, lingering, enjoying everything, taking everything up without other people being there and that's also for us super you important. You suggested this day, just for the record, I'm, <laughs> no. I'm looking at the Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were like, there oh, you the only day Wrong. we can do it is Tuesday yeah. morning, so okay. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. and that's also because the rest of the week we have team running of around, course. we have people uh, working, so then this will be a little bit too uh, disruptive. But yeah, that that is, uh, it's really important. And, and still, I mean, for me also, like my statement of purpose is to connect. So, but also with yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's not forget that. No, it, it has all these factors. It's also connecting with my body because I learned in the educational system what I went through to be a lot in my head, but not to really feel my body very well. But it's also to connect to place, to, to land to my quality of life, purpose, to my partner. And these are all very important things that you also need to, yeah, you need to sort of make space and time for that. It's super important. And yeah, the first, we also had the, the main startup years is just like you're building, building, building. And now we also feel like, okay, we can shift from that building phase more towards the, the landing phase. And, and that also allows us to have a different kind of, yeah. And not doing something schedule. is also action. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's okay. actually very important. Yeah. So I cannot let you go without asking uh, <laughs> two of the questions we... I still don't know how we come up with those questions. I think Michiel Lenstra is to blame. He came up with at least one of them, I think. And John Kempf, another one. But let's ask, first of all, because you started this farm not with a huge investment, I mean, investment of time, but not capital investment, not with a huge investor or investors behind you. There was no fund that helped you set up, et cetera, et cetera. And, but what if you were one? Because you've trained and you've had many people passing through this farm many people trained in the long courses, short courses, and, and I always wonder, let's say you, you were the, the agriculture bank that we needed to have in this country, um, and you had quite a significant investment portfolio or an investment amount ready, let's say a billion euros, um, which could be a long, long, long-term investment, like it, it, but it has to be an investment, it has to come back at some point with some financial return, and you can actually decide how much that should be, how much risk you want to take. Look, there's full flexibility. What would you do? What would you focus on? Would you focus on the students that came through here and they want to start somewhere and you can say, we can just make that happen? Or maybe some kind of tech, maybe some brands, or maybe, maybe all of it. What would you do if, let's say, the money side of the investment is not necessarily the issue? Um, what would you focus on? I would definitely invest in life. Um, so also in people. I really believe that that's the, the kind of regenerative investment we need. People who are actually doing things on the ground and making a difference. I think that's the most beautiful investment you can also do. And as an investor, I think it's also, um, of course, I'm not giving the official investment advice, but I think it's it's so nice to really connect. So nice when you do when you do the, the disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, exactly. But like we need to. Uh, it's so much more than an investment. It's more of a collaboration if you know the people you're supporting and the organizations you're supporting uh, from up close. So, I think I would invest fifty percent of that 
crazy amount. <laughs> it's not really my farm scale. Um, in indigenous organizations that make a serious difference on the ground, um, protecting lifestyles and, and life in place, but especially indigenous, especially indigenous women uh, that are at the forefront of um, many battles being fought against um, some forms of exploitation. And the other half I would invest in, um, in agriculture. Uh, and also then, yeah, in startup farmers that want to make a real difference. So organizations like Lenteland who really make the, the difference by creating the opportunities for farmers to farm, because I do think we need a lot more farmers. Uh, in the Netherlands, I think we can go up to 20% of people working again on the land. It would be amazing uh, if you talk about what kind of mm. yeah, world you want to live in. Um, and also uh, helping existing farmers who cannot make the transition because uh, yeah, they invested everything in single-use infrastructure to help them bridge that gap, that transition gap, and help them out. So everybody who is willing to make that change, uh, basically, in agriculture to support them on the ground. And, and would it be... Like, to help? Would it be flexible loans? What, what kind of... Maybe we, we don't have to go down so let's say the detailed part but what do you see as tools or things have you seen tools and things like i would just support that kind of of investment or yeah. um like what kind of tools would you use long term that's uh, one of the most important things not to to ask for the return on investment uh, in the first years Tomorrow, yeah. yeah exactly so we need in, also investment portfolios i think to to start to think more long term uh, perhaps even uh, uh, several generations, if it's financially uh, uh, possible. Um, because that's where, uh, so also not only from the gains, but also from the cost side. So if you realize what the huge costs are and how risky things are becoming when these ecosystems are becoming fragile, uh, degradation coming through, uh, not only in terms of agriculture, but also, you know, with the millions of climate migrants we're going to have around the world, water shortage, like basic existence things that are happening uh, because of degradation. So it, it doesn't make any sense to invest in that. And it also doesn't make any sense to have your money uh, stored in, in such fragile Stranded. systems yeah. going down the drain. Yeah. That's kind of mentality we need, uh, I think, for the, for the, for the transition to, uh, to come about. Yeah. yeah, I'm almost thinking, I, I wondered about that since the, almost the beginning when I, I fell into a rabbit hole of regeneration, but especially the people that have gone through places like here um, or the Richard Perkins or even Joel Salatin and other places of, of where they train and we can argue about the, the, the internship model, etc. Then they leave and they find incredible difficulties to start a farm somewhere because they don't fit in the boxes yeah. of the, the, the normal agriculture banks locally, etc. Um, but if you would ask you or others that say, okay, like almost sit next to you when the interns leave and say, okay, which one should be back? Because you know, like you can be the filter, like people like you where, where good trainings are being given, you can be that filter. Like we know, okay, who figures out the farming side, the sales side and the spreadsheet side. And that's sort of all you need at least to get started and, and to, uh, but it's never going to fit a normal loan request because it's just not, okay, I take over the farm of my, my, my parents and, and I need some new machinery. No, this is very, very different. Could be very interesting, um, also financially and very interesting in many other cases, but somehow, yeah, we haven't really figured out how to support and then how to filter and see which one makes sense, uh, which I think is a, is a big opportunity, but yeah, you need to spend time on the farm. You need to spend time on the farm, sit here, listen and see who has the entrepreneurial drive and has the, the learning capabilities to pick up the system or the systems needed. And then the, la the final question, which we always love to ask. Um, so no longer you're in charge of a billion euros, which maybe is a relief, um, but you do have, which maybe comes with even more, <laughs> more scary thoughts. You do have magic power and a magic wand, which gives you one wish. So one thing you can change overnight and, and it will go into play tomorrow morning. Um, what would it be? This one I find easier than the investment question. <laughs> yeah, I think... I know that I would um, that everybody wake up realizing that they are themselves an ecosystem. Everybody wakes up realizing that they live that in scary breakfast for many. complete reciprocity with the rest of life. 
if everybody wakes up like that, oh my God, we can start working towards a beautiful future in whatever field you're working because you're gonna work with such a different consciousness uh, and humbleness towards the rest of life. Uh, and you're gonna understand that if you take care uh, of other beings in your place and communities that you're actually taking care of yourself, I think, yeah, then um, I see a very bright future. So we might need to mix something into the evening tea of many people or the morning breakfast, so some kind of plant medicine experience, <laughs> some mushrooms here and there, just to, or in the, just in the water, we could do that. Like that, would be, that would be an interesting experiment. Could help. Could help. It would be an interesting experiment. I want to thank you so much for, uh, we're getting the, the church bells ringing for the end of the conversation, I think. And, and thank you so much for your time, taking the time on this uh, precious morning to be with us and, uh, and sharing some thoughts, some lessons learned, some surprises, some regrets, and, uh, and some answers to magic wand and billion dollar questions, or billion euro questions. Great for having you here. Thanks, Kuhn, and for the beautiful work you do. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching, for listening. If you're on the audio version only, you can find this video on YouTube or in the links below. This was the Farmer's Philosophy series where we sit down with leading regenerative farmers or farmers on a regenerative path and share not only about soil health, but much more than that, about life in general. What can we learn? What can we see? What can we observe when we get in touch with life again and understand we're all an ecosystem? So thank you so much for um, listening, watching, wherever you are in whatever context and hope to see you at the next one.